Thank you.
Duwadi, who are our musicians tonight, and I want to welcome everybody to Holborn Library, one of our library lakes. It's all part of Camden's Black History season, which we have an umbrella title, Back to the Future. So we're really, really proud and pleased to welcome Tu, who is our guest storyteller, and um, please give him a very warm welcome. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, how are you? Yeah. Yeah. I have to say to you, thank you very much for coming out and spending the evening with us. Thank you very, very, very much. We're on live, live stream as well. I would like to share with you a story. There's a couple of house rules. In this story, if I say to you, ho, can you say hey? Ho! Hey! Ho! Hey! Ho! Hey! ho. hey. Uh, the story that I would like to share with you is a story which I found very compelling. I was wondering to myself, the relationship in America between the African American and the Native American indigenous Indian. How is them together? How they mix up with each other? So I kind of find a way to make a little pattern of a story. I call it Crow Dog, the Chronicles of Crow Dog. Ho! Hey. Ho! Hey. You've got to respond to the call and response. Ho! Hey! Ho! Hey! hey. 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 Ah. <laughs> the story is roughly an hour, but I don't know if we're going to spend an hour with this story. It's just going to chronicalize some of his life and what he go through from a young boy. Listen, we are all adults. Usually I just do a lot of adult storytelling. And with adult storytelling, I just cuss and I just swear bad. But I don't know if I could do that this time. But I will tell you an adult story. Are you ready for the journey? Yeah. yeah. Then let me go on this journey. dimension to another space and time. Storytelling is about once upon a time. Let's go back to the future. Because from the past is the future and in the future we have to remember the past. They're all interconnected. We are in the 1800s now. We're in the 1800s. America is a virgin, growing, emerging country. Trying to find its way, trying to find its footing in the world. From on high, we see down below a village. Let's land. Mm -hmm. 
There's a small village. It's the southern states of America. Ho! Hey. Ho! Hey. The southern states of America. We see a small homestead. We enter. There's a young boy. His name is Henry. What's his name? Henry. Henry is his name. He's young. He's only of the age of seven. He's young. Henry lives with his mother, with his father, with his grandmother. Henry's grandmother is a full-blooded indigenous Indian. Henry's father he came from Africa and made his life there in the southern states of America. He's only seven, 1800s. It so happens, you know, that Henry heard stories from his grandmother of that land. Henry heard stories from his father of another land. Henry has two worlds in the world which he lives in now. But America is emerging and changing. The southern states within America, they wish to change the laws. No more will indigenous people be considered free. They must be bounded and bonded together. No more will free men and women be considered free. They must be bounded and bonded together. You have to understand, not only was Africans taken from Africa as a workforce, they were also taken as a food source. Europe created the largest pedophile ring you can even ever imagine. Henry's mother did not want that for Henry. They heard and they understood that the Underground Railroad was a way that could lead them from the southern states to the northern states, to Canada, to Alaska, to the open land and open space. That's what they wanted for Henry. They heard word, because you know, the word is heard within the gospel, within the gospel churches. That's where the message is given. Gonna meet you down by the riverside. I'm gonna meet you down by the riverside. Gonna meet you down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. It's all the messages telling them where they must go. Big barn in the sky. Big barn. Crossroads, crossroads. few families, they decide to get together, they will leave the southern states. There are some Quakers. The Quakers decide that they will help them. Only halfway they can help them. If anyone asks them questions, they will say, these are, these are hands, working hands. They will work with us. This is how the Quakers will move with that convoy. A few families get their wagons together and they decide that they will go north, Canada, Alaska, America. Henry has to leave his grandmother. Grandmother's old, she cannot move fast. And she, she will be a burden to them. So a few wagons, the pioneers, they move out and they take their journey. Sometimes traveling by night, sleeping by day. Sometimes traveling by day, sleeping by night. If they enter the town, they would go to the gospel church to hear the next message of where they should meet. Henry, being only seven years of age, is a very astute young boy. Like any child in these times, you have to grow fast. You have to grow into an adult quickly. The caravan moves out. The southern states have changed their laws. Laws have been changed. The police, that's how they founded the police. They turned them into, into, into catchers of runaway people. And they knew that some had flitted away and they were 
the sheriffs were employed to go and bring those back into the state and into bondage. The pioneers are on the road. One day, two days, three days, four days, a month passed, who knows how long. One night, the wagons, they make their camp. Fire burning bright. Everyone there bed down quietly nice. Ho! Hey! Ho! Hey! In the dead of the night, they hear a whooping and a hollering and a whooping and a gunshot and a flame of candles and torches. shooting, Henry's mother looks at Henry deep into his eyes. She tells him, Henry, Henry, run, run to the woods. Henry, do not come out until everything is quiet. Run, hide, Henry, hide. When everything is subdued and quiet, then come. Now go. He's only seven, but he's quick of mind. He runs as fast as he can into the pine trees. He hides himself down behind a thicket of bush. He covers his, his hands with his ears. He tries to block out the din of the screaming and the shouting and the gun shooting and the hollering and the whooping. Aye! child hiding, afraid and scared. All has gone quiet, no whooping, no hollering, no gunshots. There he waits. He can hear the beating of his own heart pushing against his chest, not knowing when to move, if to move, when to stay, when to go. He picks up the courage. He leaves his little hovel behind the bush, he makes his way, he sees the discarded clothes, he sees the overturned chests, he sees the wagons overturned, he sees strange fruit hanging in the trees. It's not a thing a child should see at the age of seven. His mind turns around and around like a whirlpool. Ho! Oh, hey, Ho! Oh, hey. Henry does not know what to do. He does not know what to think. So much desolation, so much destruction. But his mother told him, keep the mountains ahead of you. Head north, head up. Keep the mountains ahead of you. He is the only living survivor. He goes to his overturned wagon. He finds a few keepsakes. A knife. All young boys love knives. He finds a warm blanket. He's little Stokey. He's keepsake. 
He finds some dry biscuits, he finds some dry bread, he finds a few things he knows he will need for the journey. He takes a gunny sack, he puts those things inside the gunny sack. And leaving the desolation behind him, he begins to walk towards the mountain. Maybe one day passes, maybe a week passes. He lives off the dry biscuits. He lives off the berries of the forest. He lives off the sap from the trees that ooze their maple juice. He's going to go up north. He's had the taste for sugar cane. He knows where and how to survive. He would go into a town, he would ask questions. Who's gonna ask a young seven-year-old boy where you going and who you with? He would just say, I'm on an errand. And he would be on his way. Time and days have passed. He's finished that dry bread. He's finished those biscuits. He's finished all of his provisions of juice. The hunger burns in his stomach. He's cold, he's alone, he's scared, he's frightened. He walks now, kind of delirious, kind of, he's, he's walking in the forest, he's walking in the woods, he's scared and cold. He finds in the dead of the night some pine trees standing up. He sees that there's a tree as if its arms reach up into the sky, cold and desolate. He takes himself in between those two trees and wraps himself with his keepsake blanket and falls asleep. begins to disturb his sleep is that he realizes he's no longer alone. When he lifts his eyes open, he sees before him shadows. Shadows are standing there, more than one, more than two, plenty shadows all around him. He hears someone speak in a tongue of which he does not understand. You boy, this place, not good, come. We go. He does not understand the words of what is being said to him. He does not understand the, the, the movement of the, of the spoken, unspoken words. You boy, this place, not good. Come, we go. Henry recoils back in between those trees until a woman with a sweet voice Broken French and English says, La garçon, écoutez. Entrez, la garçon. Entrez. This place, no good. Come. We go. Allez, allez. Allez. Henry remembers the voice of his mother, the voice of his grandmother, the voice of the women that he grows up with. Henry remembers how sweet it is to bury his head between the breasts of a woman. And with unabashed hurry, he runs into her open arms. She takes him close 
into herself. He feels her head against her breast. He hears her heart beating and he remembers his mother, his grandmother. The big tall man who spoke in a language he doesn't understand picks Henry up and places Henry on the back of a sledge which is being pulled by a pony. The big man slaps the rump of the pony. Hey, we go. And they begin to travel. Henry doesn't realize he's been taken in by some Seminole Indian, one of the many nations of the indigenous people of America. Ho! 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 Henry lies there on the back of the sledge, looks up at the stars above his head, and falls deeply asleep. Next thing Henry remembers, he lifts his eyes to see young braves running this way and that way. The Seminoles have come back into camp. The young braves, they stop and they look with their eyes and mouths open. Who be this dark skinned boy there? Who be there? The women, they come out from their teepees, from their log cabins. They look, they see the newcomer. Hey, who be this one? The truth, they go to the end cabin of the village. There in that cabin there is an old woman. Her name is Goose Mother. What's her name? Goose Mother. Goose Mother is her name. The big tall man calls her, hey, Goose Mother. Goose Mother, she has white, white hair. She comes, she's old. Ah! The big tall man says, Goose Mother, you are old. Your son has grown and flown the nest. Goose Mother, you have no one to fetch for you water. You have no one to fetch for you wood. You have no one to take care of you, Goose Mother. Goose Mother, I found this prairie dog pointing to Henry. This one will be your hands, your eyes, your ears. Goose Mother, teach this one well. Teach this one our custom, our language, our, our ways of being. Teach him all that you know, Goose Mother. He will be of service to you. Goose Mother looks at Henry up and down. Why oh, are you skinny? You're going to be good. You're going to be good. Henry knows what to say. He nods his head without a word. Ah, good, 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 good. Then you might as well come. You'll be my eyes, you'll be my ears, you'll be my tongue. Come. Henry knows the, the comfort of an elder, the warmth and the wisdom of an elder. He's grown up around elders. He has no fear for them. He enters into her cabin and he begins to live a life. She teaches him the language of the Seminole people. She teaches him all that she knows. Ho! Hey. Ho! Hey. Goose Mother is the one that looks after the village. She rises up early in the morning. She goes to get the early morning <coughs> mushroom. She goes to get the early morning bud of flower. She goes to get the bark from the tree. She makes the poultice. 
She brews the tea. She knows how to cure those who have a breach of child. She knows how to cure those who are cut off skin and is wounded. She knows how to take care of all those in the village. They know Goose Mother. Goose Mother's medicine is good. Now she has a young one to teach all that she knows. And Henry learns fast. He's past seven, he's past eight, nine, ten, he's past eleven, he's past twelve, he's about twelve, thirteen years of age, he's a good young man, hey, he moves around, all the young braves, they respect him, and he respects all the young braves, they consider him to be a brother, and he considers them to be his brother. Goose Mother comes to him one day and says, Henry, you are soon to be a man. You must seek your vision. Henry looks at Goose Mother. Goose Mother tells him, Every boy must face their fear. I will take you out into the woods. I will leave you there overnight. You will have to face your fear. Do not let your fear conquer you. I will come for you in the morning. Try to find your spirit song. Try to find your healing song. Do not let your fear conquer you. I shall return. The days they pass and the day comes. She tells him. Come now, it's time for you to pass through your initiation. Henry is scared. He does not know what to expect, but he follows Goose Mother. He's 13 years of age, he's a young man. He trusts her. She's won his trust. Ho, hey. ho. Hey. They're in the thick of the forest. It's late in the evening. She tells him, I shall, I, I will come in the morning. Find your place, find your space. Make that yours. Seek a vision. The vision shall be with you for the rest of your life. And she leaves. For a while, Henry walks around the forest looking at the trees, looking around. He does not know what to do with himself. He does not know. It's darker, it's darker, there's dark sky, there's no moon. He can feel his heart pushing against his chest. He decides to sit down in a, in, in a kind of like a dip in the ground. It's kind of a, it's a kind of a womb. He sits there in silence. He hears the terrors of his past invade into his imagination. He hears the hollering and the crying. He hears the gunshot. He's scared. He wants to get up. He wants to run. He feels the ghosts of his memories coming to haunt him. But then he becomes still and he begins to sing. I remember being a mountain, leaving the earth and reaching for the sky, watching the clouds past me, I felt like I would never die. I remember being an eagle, opening my wings and taking flight, flying the heat beneath me, trying to reach a higher high. I remember being a tree, digging in my roots in to survive, watching the foliage of leaf around me, giving shade to the incoming light, giving shade to the incoming light. Giving shade to the incoming light. I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. Ho! Hey. Ho! Hey. The next thing is someone's poking him in the ribs. He opens his eyes to see Goose Mother looming over him. 
Goose mother asked him. Well, wake up, boy, you, you, you're sleeping. Well, did you get a vision? He looks up at her. He says, yes, yes, Goose mother. I found a spirit song. I found my song, the one that will heal me and take me through this life. But I was invaded by my past fears and I do not understand. Goose mother says, it's good, it's good, you don't understand, it's good. Because if you don't understand, you have to understand what it is that you don't understand. Think about it, it's good, it's good. Come boy, it's time we go. Henry follows Goose mother. Ho! Hey. Ho! Hey. Ho! Age of 13. He's past the age of 40, 50, 60. America is always changing, always changing, never a constant. the age of about 16, 17 years of age now, Henry is. The chief, he calls all the young braves together. He says to them, listen, the winter is coming. Oh, the elder women will need to be fed. The young babies will need to be fed. The young expected mothers, their breasts need to have milk. Young braves, you are faced with the task to go and kill grandfather. Who is this grandfather, you ask? Grandfather is a huge seven foot tall and more grizzly bear. You know in these times, nature and creation was all brothers and sisters. So they called the grizzly bear grandfather. Grandfather's been foraging. His body is full of fat. He has been harvesting and he's kept all of his energy. The one who can kill and capture grandfather and bring the food back into the village will have the ululation of all the women. That one amongst you will wear grandfather's pelt and you will dance around the sacred fire and you will tell the story of how victorious grandfather was. Ho! Oh. And so it is. The day passes. And the day comes. All the young braves there, 16, 17, 18 years of age, all ready to show their prowess, all ready to be victorious, all ready to have the women sing and ululate their name, all ready to have the elders look at them as a new generation stepping forward. All the young ones are there. I'll tell you some of them. Kills quickly his namesake. Speaks boldly his namesake. He doesn't hold back a tongue. If he's got something on his mind, he'll tell you. Running stream. All of the young braves, they're all there ready to show their prowess in pursuit of grandfather, a seven foot tall and more grizzly bear. The young ones, they set out and they go in search. They can smell grandfather. Grandfather smells strong. They're in the thick woods. They know that grandfather is close about. Grandfather is there around. They can smell grandfather. They can see the tracks. They can see the defecation, the dung, which has been left here and there, the broken twig, the footprint in the earth. 
grandfather comes from nowhere like a wichita, which is like a ghost, comes from nowhere, opens his clawed paw, and he brushes past a young brave. And when he brushes past a young brave, his claw digs into the young brave's body so that all of his flesh opens out like the pages of a book. Grandfather runs into a thick bush and is gone. The young brave falls to the ground with blood gushing out from the open wound. It was Henry. Henry learned so much from Guzman. Henry went, he found the, the correct tree, the bark. He took the sap, he came back, he massaged it into the open wound. He knew what plant, he took that plant, he put it on top of the wound, he made a poultice, he got some bark, he made a linear all around the body of that young brave wound so that all that flesh which opened up like a book now folded closed. The young brave held his stomach. Henry asked him, why don't you go back? Go back to the village. And the young brave said, no, I will see this to the end. I will not go back, not now. We have grandfather. Let us continue. And the braves, they continue. They follow the same opening that grandfather had made. Now they feel that they are close by, not far away. They can smell grandfather. Grandfather's been rustled. Grandfather's angry. They want to kill him. Ah! Grandfather comes out of nowhere, from nowhere. He opens his jaw. The jaw crushes down upon one of the young braves, breaking all the bone and the muscle in the shoulder. The grandfather grizzly bear picks up the young brave and throws him to one side. Kills quickly, had his obsidian blade. He jumps upon the back of grandfather. He digs his blade into the shoulder blade of grandfather. Holding on, grandfather screeches. <laughs> grandfather throws the young brave off so that he falls upon the floor and rolls away. Then grandfather runs and is gone. The young brave with the broken shoulder, with all the blood and with all the crushing of the bone underneath, rolls in pain on the ground. It is Henry who goes down by the riverside and draws the mud from the stream. It's Henry who places the mud over the wound of the young brave, telling him, that the mud would draw out all the sap and the poison from the grizzly bear's saliva's mouth. Henry, he goes and gets a linear from a tree and begins to wrap that young brave shoulder tight, clicking back into place the shoulder blade. All the young braves that stand around, they look at Henry and they say, Henry, you have learnt well from Goose Mother. She has taught you very well indeed. Oh, Henry. oh, Henry. Henry, today we will give you a new name. You shall no longer be called Henry. We will call you Henry medicine car. Oh! And all the braves respond in the call and response. Henry has a new name. But now they still have to go in pursuit of grandfather. They follow the trail blood that the obsidian wound had made in the blade of the back of the grizzly bear. They follow it up into the mountains. And now they see that the trail blood enters a cave. All the brave, they stand there at the mouth of the cave. None of them wish to enter. They know it's dangerous. A grizzly bear which has been harmed and injured, it would tear you to pieces, let alone a mother grizzly bear who has a cub. This one is wounded. 
all the young braves. They stand there looking at the mouth of the cave. The one who was wounded by the open claw paw, he goes and he prostrates before the cave and he says, Ah, grandfather, ah, you think you can kill me? I am not dead, grandfather. Look, look, I still live. Aye! And he steps back. The brave who was crossed by the shoulder of grandfather, he goes and prostrates before the cave. Grandfather, grandfather, you soon shall die, grandfather. I will champion your song. I will tell the story of your life, grandfather. Aye! And he steps back. None will enter. Henry steps forward and says, My brothers, I ask you this. Which one of you will enter the cave? Does grandfather have us trapped or do we have grandfather trapped? Which one of us will enter the cave and have the women of the village ululate their name? Which one of us will have the generations small that will grow tall and tell the story of this day? I am not blood of your blood but you have accepted me as your brother, and I have accepted you as my brother. But the task and the job is not done. I have spoken. Ho! Oh! And Henry steps down, speaks boldly, steps forward, and addresses everyone. My brothers, Henry Medicine Carr, We've given him a new name. He's taught and learnt very well from Goose Mother. It seems to me like Henry is asking for permission to enter the cave and do battle with Grandfather. Which one of you say that we give and grant Henry permission? Ho! Hey. Ho! Hey. And speaks boldly, steps back. Now, Henry Medicine Calf has got the confirmation that he is the one that has to enter the cave. He didn't want this. He thinks to himself, oh shit. I got myself in something I can't get out of. I can't turn around and say something now. I'm gonna look bad. Henry looks into the mouth of the dark cave. He takes some skin that he had around him like a loincloth. He wraps that around his forearms. He takes his his obsidian blade into his hands. He speaks into the mouth of the cave. Grandfather, I'm ready to die. Today is a good day to die. Grandfather, if you win and I lose, if I win and you lose, Grandfather, I will champion your name. I will dance with your skin around the sacred fire. All will know that you are a great warrior. I will sing for you my death song. And Henry begins to throw dirt and dust all over his body. Aye, aye. He sings his death song and enters the cave. All the young braves stand around, open eyed, open mouth. There is a hollering and a screaming inside. Then there's the death of silence. All the young braves think either Henry's dead and the grizzly bear is about to exit or Henry will exit. But none will enter. And at that moment of what they should do and what they shouldn't do, they see Henry. He's coming with his back to them. He's drawing something heavy, huge, in front of him. All of his back is ripped with the claws of the grizzly bear. All of his flesh and his muscle and his sinew and his bone is exposed with the fight of battle. Henry draws out this huge, huge, huge grizzly bear and lays it down to rest before all the young braves with open mouth and open eyes. They watch how Henry Medicine Calf was victorious. And in silence, they see Henry. He's 
He kneels down close to the air of the grizzly bear and he whispers, Grandfather, forgive me, Grandfather. I did not wish to take your life, but with your meat, it would feed so many in the village. Grandfather, I do not wish for your spirit to haunt me. Grandfather, you are a victorious warrior. We battled hard. We battled strong. But I won. Grandfather, I will sing your praise and chant your story around the sacred fire. Grandfather, sleep. Be at peace. And sleep now. All the young braves, they're in honor of, of, of the respect that Henry Medicine Calf shows the grizzly bear. They truss it up, hands and feet. They put a stick between it and they pick it up and they take it all the way back to the camp. And when they take it to the camp, all the women, the old women, the young, the old, they all are like, yee! brought into the camp and they hear it was Henry and the other braves say but we've given him a new name his name is Henry Medicine Car that night Henry or not that night maybe a couple of nights after after it's been skinned, they give him the, the, the grandfather pelt. They give it to him. He wears it like a coat. He adorns the head of the grizzly bear upon his own head. He has the pride of the village. He has the respect. And he tells sometimes around the fire the story of how grandfather grizzly was a victorious warrior, of how he battled, of how he leapt, of how he stabbed. And he would dance around the sacred fire and all the children would listen to the story again and again and again. tell you many more chronicles of crow dog but I would like to leave you with the last chronicle because there's many more in between Henry has passed the age of 20 21 22 Henry had a new name because in one of the chronicles he was met by some wolves who spoke to him. We know you. You are Henry Medicine Car. They take him into their cave. Henry Medicine Calf was naked. They warm him with the fur of their bodies. When Henry wakes up, he sees the wolves around him. He asks them, why didn't you attack me? The wolves, they say, you know Goose Mother. Goose Mother takes care of us. We take care of you. That story, he heard a crow calling. The wolves, they said to him, it's time for you to go. Follow the crow. Henry leaves the cave of the wolves, comes out and follows the crow all the way back to his camp. In this story he hears that Goose Mother has died. And since that day, a crow always followed him. He had a new name. Henry Medicine Car Crow. Henry has reached the age of about 56, 60, 65 years of age. Oh, he's an old man. He's a mature man. 
I wish I could share with you all the chronicles of Crow Dog. But now he's at the last days of his life. Smallpox, the measles, it's invaded America, it's everywhere. People are dying like flies. The reservations that they have put them to live on, that is not enough for them to even grow seed or grain. One day, speaks boldly, comes into the cabin of Henry Medicine Car Crow and says, my daughter is sick. Can you heal her? Henry says, well, I will see what I can do. He puts on his snowshoes and he wades out into the snow and he comes to the cabin of Speaks Boldly. He sees that Speaks Boldly's daughter lies there in a bed full of pelts, 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 but still she is cold, she shivers. Her eyes roll back in her head. She coughs. She emits fluid from her nose, from her ears, from her eyes, from her mouth, from her buttocks, from her vagina. She emits fluid everywhere. Speaks boldly, asks Henry Medicine Calf Crow, please, can you help my daughter? She has the sickness. Henry removes all the pelts. She lies there with her naked chest. She's only of the age of 12. She shivers. She's cold. She's ice cold. Henry puts his air next to her chest and listens. I see a fox, he says. There's a fox out there in the snow. The fox is hungry. The fox is cold. If we can find the fox and bring the fox back into the camp, maybe the fox in relation can help your daughter. Look, says Henry Medicine Calf Crow. Take this dry meat in a pouch. If you find the fox, give it to the fox. Bring the fox back into the cabin, and then we will see what we can do. Speaks boldly, puts on his snowshoes, and he wades out into the snow. He sees the little, the little marks in the snow as if they're tracks. He puts his finger into the track and he can see it's still covered over with ice. Like a creature had passed that way but not so long. The ice has not melted. He follows, he follows the track. Back in the cabin, Henry Mason Calf Crow listens to the young girl's chest. The fox knows someone is coming. Heat the water, put sage onto the fire, rub her down with cold water. She will sweat soon, profusely. By this time out in the snow, speaks boldly. He follows the tracks. He keeps on putting his finger into the holes. He can see that the holes are wet. A warm creature has passed this way and he's not far away from it. Back in the cabin, Henry Mesenkar listened to the young girl's chest and says, the vixen, she's scared. She knows someone is in pursuit of her. Quick, hurry, stop the fire. And they begin to stoke the fire. They put the sage into the fire. The whole room becomes warm and aglow. Out in the snow, speaks boldly, sees the vixen. The vixen is doubled almost like a you, like her nose is touching her ass. The vixen smells a human being, and the vixen growls. 
speaks boldly, tells the vixen, do not worry, be calm, I mean you no harm, I, I come to help you, don't worry. He opens up his pouch of meat, he takes out some meat, he throws the meat down. The vixen, she does not like the smell of a human, but yet the smell of meat is far more better. She grabs the meat. <coughs> eat, eat, it's good for you. Back in the cabin, Henry Mesenkopf listens to the young girl's chest. The young girl begins to flay her arms up and down, her legs open and kick this way and that way. Mesenkopf tells the elder women, hold her down, hold her down, keep her down to the bed. Hold her down, lash her down, wipe her down with wet snow, wipe her down. Her eyes roll back in her head. She coughs out gunk. Her fluid comes from her ears and from every orifice. They wipe it, they keep her clean. Out in the snow. Speaks boldly, has won the courage of the vixen. The vixen now comes close. He tells the vixen, all shall be good, all shall be well. Do not worry. He picks the vixen up. She shakes. She shivers. To be in the hands of a human is not natural for her. But she feels the warmth of a, of a body. And she becomes calm. Back in the cabin, the young girl becomes calm. Henry Mason Calf listens to her chest. He tells everyone in the cabin, speaks boldly has found the vixen it shall be good with her now all shall be well wipe her down with wet snow place the pelts burn the sage we have a visitor coming out in the snow her father speaks boldly he brings now back this vixen the door opens, he puts the vixen down. The vixen smells all the inhabitants of human beings. The vixen runs into the corner of the cabin and growls at everyone. <laughs> Henry Medicine Carp says, bring milk mixed with honey. If you have an egg, a goose egg, beat it in with the milk and the honey. Feed the vixen. They bring the contents of what he asks. The vixen, she laps it up. They bring her dry meat. The vixen, she eats it up. That day passes into a new day. Each time they bring food for the vixen, the vixen grows fatter, healthier. Stronger. After seven days have passed, the vixen is strong. The young girl, she does not shiver, she does not move, she is at peace. Henry Medicine Calf says, Open the door, allow the vixen to leave. They open the door. The vixen sees the open escape of an exit. The vixen runs, goes to the threshold of the door, stops, looks back into the cabin, looks at everyone who is there. And then she leaves. And as soon as the vixen leaves, the young girl, her eyes flicker. And she says, Father, I had a dream. I dreamt I was lost in the snow. I dreamt I was cold, but you came. I dreamt I was hungry, but you fed me. Father, I had a bad fever, but I'm well now. And the father, he bows down, he kisses his daughter, he holds her in his arms, he looks at Henry Medzenkoff and he says, Henry, you shall have a new name. Today you shall be called no longer Henry Medzenkoff Crow. We will call you Crow Dog. Because in one of these stories, which I did not share with you, he was able to remove prairie dogs 
from Homestead's farm. So now he just became known as Henry Crowther. My story's come to an end, but before I end, I must tell you this. There was a time in America when America government wanted to know how many indigenous Indians are living on reservations. They sent out a poll, a consensus, to take the information of how many Indians lived on reservations. A list was drawn up of all the different tribes, the Seminole, the Apache, the Arapaho, the Blackfeet, all of them was there. They came to the village of the Seminole. They took their names, Running River, New Stream, Morning Mountain. They came to this man, dark skin, dark skin, more darker than those that were around him, because you know, some Native American Indians are very dark. All the way from Africa, from the Old Mix Society, but that's another story. They look him and they ask him, what are you doing amongst these people? And Henry says, they are my people. They are the blood of my blood. They have accepted me as their brother and I accept them as, their, as, as my brother. And they ask him, but you're an African boy. What are you doing living amongst these Native American Indians? We've come to take a consensus. What can we say about you? And Henry says, well, I've lived my life there, and this is where I am. Oh, they ask him, then we need to write down your name. What's your name? He says, my name is Crow Dog. They say, we can't write Crow Dog. Don't you have another name? And he says, I remember a long, long time ago, when I was very small, age seven, I used to be called Henry. Ah, oh, says the consensus man. That's a good name, Christian name, yeah. So we'll call you Henry Crow Dog. And that's how he became known as Crow Dog. I wish I could share with you all the different chronicles of Crow Dog and the story of Crow Dog. How he got his wife, Beaver Woman. How he went to Russell Horses how he became a man but this i was interested in how did the african live alongside the native american indian how was their lives intertwined we don't hear this story but i have shared this story with you oh oh let's go guys let's go let's go
done the CDs there. Don't, 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 don't have a look, there's some CDs. And I have another show, November on the 25th. On the 25th, I have another show. I will be with a, a really good storyteller. His name is Yusufu, the Cowfoot Prince. And we will be at number five, St. Pancras um, Square. St. Pancras Square. Tell a friend if you can't make it, spread the word. Storytelling is about sharing. Please share. Thank you very much. Please wait once again. Oh! Thank you.